You have come through so much heartache and betrayal. You've been gaslit, manipulated, you've been caught in a toxic cycle that had you feeling utterly trapped. But not only did you find the courage to finally leave, you've been on your own beautiful healing journey and sitting here right now happy and thriving. So what manipulative tactics did you miss that now you know are just dangerous warning signs? When I meet someone new, if they are overly nice for no reason, or if they are overly uh, complimentary for no reason, to me right now, with where I am, that's a huge red flag. Because I know me, I know I'm a nice person, and I know I deserve to be complimented on everything I've been through and everything I've accomplished, but that person still doesn't know that. They don't know past the surface. So what is it that you are trying to get by being overly nice or over complimentary. That's the first thing that goes through my mind is this is this spells danger because it's a big sign of potential love bombing, setting you up for a relationship that's transactional, where it's like, I'm going to offer you so much so that you could feel indebted to me one day, or I'm going to offer you so much more than anyone else has ever offered you so that you could look at me always as someone who stood out in that way and I've just given you so much. Or it could be that they are giving you 100% at the beginning and then they start decreasing that percentage over time bit by bit in very subtle ways. And you're at a point at the end where you're like, what happened? You used to be so nice, you used to be so kind. So that over niceness and kindness and being complimentary for no reason, I, that's a big red flag for me. Another one is the way I feel in my body. So we've talked about this in previous interviews. Tuning into your body is very, very, very important with people. So whereas in the past, if I was around a person who represented a familiar pattern from my childhood or from my adult years where I get that feeling of safety as in this is familiar I know how to navigate it even though I can tell it's toxic my body feels safe because it knows how to survive in an environment like that now that I've done the work to tune in to how that familiarity actually feels in my body because it, it doesn't feel good to be in the presence of something familiar that's now you're aware is actually toxic is actually manipulative is actually narcissistic is actually abusive when you are aware that that's what the safety in your body is like, you're like, that's not the safety I want. I want to live a life that's authentic. And to live a life that's authentic, I shouldn't be going toward a definition of safety that's protective, like I know how to survive this. I should be going toward a definition of safety that's expansive, like I can be vulnerable, I can fully be myself, and I can feel safe. So now that I've recognized that, when I meet someone new and I feel that familiarity from the past, immediately I'm like, nope, we, this familiarity we know feels like tension in my arms. It feels like I can't breathe properly, like my chest is collapsing. I don't like this feeling. And so, you know, sometimes people say, well, how can you trust your body like what if your body's just scared of something that's really good for it like how how can you just say trust your gut when you don't have actual evidence and this is my answer the moment you took your first breath in this life that's how long your body has been with you your body remembers things that you don't remember that you're not conscious of when you were two months old or a year or two or three years old, you don't remember what your body learned, but your body knows. So if you're in a situation where your body says, we don't feel good, we're agitated, we're feeling uneasy, we're feeling like this is way too overwhelming, way too much. Yeah, you can trust it without having physical evidence that there's a reason that you need to slow things down or take a pause, have a conversation. So this was one of the most mind-blowing lessons I learned in therapy. And I actually wrote about it in The Only Constant. I was in a therapy session and I told my therapist, I know 
these relationships that are in my life are toxic. I know they're not good for me. I talk to people about walking away from relationships like this. I know they're not healthy for me. I know I don't feel good, but somehow I choose to stay. Why? And I judge myself and I can't sleep at night and I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I can't believe I'm still keeping those bonds in my life. It literally feels like they're chains that are just holding me in place. They're, they're pulling at me and I'm in the center and I'm just like, I don't know where to go. I judge myself and my therapist goes, I'll never forget this. I remember exactly where I was sitting when she said this to me and I was miserable. Like I remember feeling so down and like I was suffocating. And she goes to me, have you considered that your body also has a choice? And I was like, what? She's like, your body can make a choice just like your mind does. So maybe your mind knows that you need to leave or that you need to end these relationships and cut these cords and these bonds. But your body's like, I'm protecting myself by not walking away. Because your body thinks that if I walk away, really what's happening is you're, you're pushing the limits of your survival mode and your body's like, that's danger. It's what happens when you feel like you really want to physically get up and open the door and walk away, but you feel like you're sinking into the couch. It's because your body's like, no, that's dangerous. Because maybe when you were younger, you learned about unconditional loyalty in relationships like no matter what happens you stay maybe you saw your parents go through a cycle like that so you learn that leaving is extremely dangerous so even though your mind knows it's the best thing for you your body's trying to protect you and it shuts down it goes into one of the trauma responses like fawning or freezing or so that's why you sit there and you're like i literally feel like i can't move so the answer is to look at it as we need to bring our mind and body into alignment. So it's, it really is about changing what your body's familiar is. And you use the word comfortable, like maybe your body's comfortable. Your body, actually, if you ask it what that familiarity feels like, like sitting in a toxic environment, that you know how to navigate, you know that you need to be quiet at certain points, you know that you need to reword something so that they don't get defensive or whatever. That's familiar to your body and it's, it's a way, those are strategies to protect yourself. But if you ask yourself, how does this feel? Really, it's not comfortable. It's extremely uncomfortable because you're, you're fighting with yourself. Like your body's like, shaking sometimes or you're just you're pushing down what you really want to say or the life that you really want to live it's extremely uncomfortable mm -hmm. I always ask people this question I say uh what was your snapping point like what was the moment you just you got up and you left I ask this all the time because people know for a long time before they're going to end a relationship or before they cut a bond they have with a family member or they just they know for a long time and they feel stuck and they feel like they just can't move forward with it. It's too scary. But then there's always that one little event that happens and it's like the blurry thing that was in front of them just disappears and they see things clearly and they're like, that's it, I'm done. And they're done. And they never look back. It's interesting how in a moment like that, everything flashes before your eyes. Like, all the things in that relationship that hurt you and upset you and the things that you've accepted for so long that it's like you look at you look back at yourself and you say how did i accept that like i right now don't accept that and i feel like every version of me that existed in that relationship also didn't accept that but i somehow convinced myself that it was okay for me to accept that or that there was no other option like i had to it, and it's, it's a truth because if what's more important for you is to keep the relationship, you're going to lower your standards. You're going to overlook so many things. And if you are with a manipulative person, the littlest grievance that you bring up isn't met with openness and acceptance and willingness to understand your feelings and sit with you in those feelings. It's usually met with 
either defensiveness or they're blaming you for your own feelings or for bringing something up or if you're not happy just leave mm -hmm. and so you know if you bring something up there's going to be the threat that this relationship will end so give yourself compassion and say my intention wasn't to be manipulated my intention wasn't to be lied to my intention wasn't to be put in a position where i have to choose between my self-worth and what i deserve and staying in this relationship I, sh i shouldn't have ever been put in a position like that and so when you give those past versions of you including the past versions of your body and what it sought and what it thought was more important that connection with them then you're able to in a moment like that when you snap you say you know what i'm not judging myself i'm not going to look back and say i should have left two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago this was the right time for me to leave wow that was so beautiful and so i've never heard of the familiarity thing mm. from a you can use it as a way to say this isn't right for me because so mm -hmm. many right we keep repeating Many of us repeat our, our mistakes because of that familiarity, because yeah. it almost feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you having gone through all that, yeah. being able to then almost like articulate, okay, this isn't, this is very familiar to me. Okay, mm -hmm. is that good or bad? It doesn't serve me. Okay, how mm -hmm. do I change that? Then I think a big part of what you're saying is you've put words and language to all the things that had happened, mm -hmm. right? Is that, oh, he did lie to me. That was manipulation. Mm -hmm. And now having, putting words is the thing that I hear a lot. It's like once I've put words to it, people don't feel like they're going crazy. It doesn't feel like it's just them. And now they feel um, almost have that validation in mm -hmm. themselves. It's like, this is why you left because it wasn't good for you. The, the tactics that people use with us, I think it's harder for us to see the more deeper in the relationship we are. So if we can see it, from the get-go, mm. then maybe we don't end up going down a spiral that ends up becoming mm -hmm. harder to get out of. Mm -hmm. um, what other forms have you seen and heard that we can start to really look out for? The silent treatment is one of the first things that comes to me. When you're really trying to be heard by someone, mm -hmm. when you're really trying to be seen by them for the pain that you're in, that they took part in, when you're trying to express to them how their actions or their words affected you, hurt you, made you feel betrayed, instead of them responding to you, they will just completely go quiet and hope that you either retract what you just said or that you never bring it up again or that you have a battle with yourself over whether you should have said it or not, whether you're overreacting or not. And sometimes, the silent treatment is also intended to make you feel even more attached to that person. Mm, why is because that? Because it because you begin to try harder to prove your worth to that person. So sometimes they'll use the I don't want to say it's indifference, I want to say it's intentional indifference to make you feel like you need to try harder. Like maybe if you scream loudly enough they will listen to you. Maybe if you try hard enough to be or mold into the person that they want you to be who is, you know, quiet and never brings up these issues and is okay with them, then they will be like, oh, she deserves that I stay with her or that I give her attention or that I marry her one day or whatever. So the silent treatment is a huge red flag because the silent treatment is literally telling you, like if I give you the silent treatment, I am telling you. I don't see you like you're right there and you know that you're right there, but you feel like I'm looking at you, but I'm seeing right through you. That's devastating when we feel that. So it puts you in a very weak and vulnerable position and you're, you're seeking comfort or support or to feel seen or to feel heard. And if that's the person in your life that you love, that's your partner. Obviously, you, you want that from them. So they become the person who's hurting you and in your mind, the only person who can heal you. So they become the person who makes you feel like they are blind to you or like you don't deserve the time of day with them. And at the same time, they are the person whose time of day you want and they are the person who you want to be seen by. So it becomes like a, 
it be, the relationship becomes more addictive. Mm. That's how trauma bonds work. So the silent treatment from very early on, I would definitely say that's a huge red flag. I also should say for many people listening, they might think, well, I was with someone who was amazing for the first six months or for the first year and I there were genuinely no red flags. And then out of the blue, once we settled down together, everything changed. Don't blame yourself for not seeing it sooner. They could have done that good of a job because they knew that that's what it took to get you. So don't blame yourself for falling for that. Don't blame yourself for not seeing it any sooner. But once you start seeing it, start registering it as this is who they really are, not as an exception to my image of them and what it is. It's not an exception. If there's a behavior that's completely off and it comes a year in or two years in, you really have to pay attention to that and not file it under like it's a one-time thing. Well, where did that come from? And, and sit with that. Because I think what happens is once you're so invested in someone, it's harder for you to look at the bad things that happen as signs that you need to leave. You mm -hmm. might see it as a sign of, you know, we've been together for two or three years or 10 years. We've invested so much in each other. We've started a business together. We've started a family together. Maybe this is just something that we work through. And there isn't even an option in your mind that maybe this is something that needs to not be in your life altogether. So I just needed to say that because I know some people are like, I, I really didn't see it. Mm. There really were no signs. This person just changed. So don't see it as there's something wrong with you for not being able to see it. You weren't being shown it to see it. Yeah, I think that's super powerful to uh, point out because I don't think, uh, I think we very much internalize it. And especially as we talk about red flags and signs mm -hmm. and stuff like that, it's like I don't want people to feel guilty about having not seen it or to interpret a flag, a red flag for a green flag and things like that. Yeah. So I think that's super powerful for you to say. And then also in those moments that maybe you haven't seen it and it comes a year later or whenever, mm -hmm. I think now in hindsight, having built my confidence, I would just address it like immediately. I say, hey, look, maybe you didn't mean to. You've never done this before, but actually you just gave me the silent treatment. It didn't mm -hmm. feel very good. And maybe there's an intention behind the silent treatment. Maybe you didn't mean to. Maybe you're shutting down because you're having an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. How can I support you? But still, it didn't feel good. Like mm -hmm. I would just call it for what it was, Absolutely. right on the spot. Yeah. That way they know, it's like there's different mechanisms to that tactic. Number one, you're letting that person know, I see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Number two, you're calling it. So now it's like, if you do it again, I'm gonna call you on it again. Yes. So it kind of makes them know, hey, look, this tactic I recognize, Maybe there's an issue here. Mm -hmm. Let's talk through it. I don't want to assume, right? I don't want to jump straight to, it's a manipulation tactic and they're Absolutely. doing it Absolutely, you're right. Yeah. But I don't want to just sweep it under the rug either because mm -hmm. to your point, what happens two years down the line? What happens three years down the line? Now, four years down the line, you're like, well, they've done it to me so much, it's harder for me to speak up now than it was when it first happened. Yeah, and it's like you're being trained over time that yeah. you know you're going to get the silent treatment if you attempt to communicate certain things mm -hmm. or if you attempt to hold them accountable for anything. Let's say you are with someone who that's one of their defaults. They shut down and they just don't want to say anything. The simplest thing they could do is tell you, I'm feeling like I'm shutting down. I need some time to myself. And then they should come to you when they're ready to talk to you about it. I have empathy for anyone who struggles with expressing themselves. I know many people in relationships have that issue. And it's not out of lack of love or respect to their partner that they don't communicate or that they go quiet. But at the same time, it is also used as a manipulation tactic by many. So if you're in a relationship where you are quite aware that the person you're with doesn't have an issue communicating with other people, but it only happens that way when it comes to you, mm. that's, a, that's a big sign because it's like, okay, Help me understand what it is that you need to feel comfortable expressing yourself to me the same way that you feel comfortable expressing yourself to other people in your life. That's a great question to ask 
And again, if you're met with defensiveness or you're not getting any answers and you're telling yourself all these excuses for why they are the way that they are, but they are not helping you figure it out, mm -hmm. you could choose to stay, but you could also ask yourself, what on earth is the purpose of being in a relationship? What's the purpose of being in a relationship if you feel like you can't communicate with your partner? If you feel like you can't bring up a grievance to your partner, what is the purpose? It would be better to be single and surround yourself with friends and people who you can talk to and people who will listen to you and will see you than it is to constantly be in an environment where you're made to feel like you you have no idea what's going on. You don't have clarity on what this person is feeling and where their behavior is coming from. A lot of people are stuck in relationships like that. I think that's one of the hardest when A, you don't know where it's coming from mm -hmm. and then what the intentions behind it are. Yeah. You know, I think that's why gaslighting has become such a thing. And I'm so proud of us for always talking about it to yeah. really, like I never knew that word growing up. And so when it would happen, you didn't realize what was happening. It does make you feel like you're freaking going crazy. Yeah. And especially when you're in a relationship, you hopefully admire the person you're with, right? You love that person. You really like respect mm -hmm. them, hopefully. Um, and so if you feel like that towards someone else and then they're gaslighting you or doing these other manipulation tactics, sometimes you don't realize what's happening. Yeah. Um, and so recently I've heard the word um, zombies. Yeah. Have you heard that? Yeah. <laughs> so please explain what it is. I'm like figuring out all the When lingo. you go zombie on someone, one, it's like you ghost them and then out of the blue you come back into their life with this elaborate story of why you were away and it's like someone coming back from the dead saying I want you I love you I want us to be together and it happens quite a bit and I see this trend on TikTok that says um, they always come back they always come back you know if they break up with you if they go ghost on you if they if they treat you like you mean absolutely nothing to them, they always come back. That's not true. It's not true. I don't believe it's true. <laughs> so there was a, a new trend that's, that's coming up now where people are saying, they're stitching videos like that and saying, how is that a compliment? Like if mm. someone comes back to you, maybe it's because no one else accepted them. If someone, if, if someone comes back to you, maybe all the other people that they met and got to know, none of them gave them the kindness and love and respect and the feeling of safety that you gave them. But why did they have to leave such a good thing to realize what it's worth. If you wake up every morning craving that first cup of coffee, but also actually dreading the bloating, the jitters, and the crashes that come with it, you're so not alone, especially for us women. But let's face it, what's the alternative? Zombieing through our morning half awake? Now, this finally a coffee replacement actually designed for women from Peak called Nandaka. Every cup of Nandaka nourishes you and uplifts your energy instead of making you feel anxious and jittery. Nandaka is expertly formulated with the highest quality and purest ingredients to activate your metabolism, provide sustained energy and balance your hormones. Kick your coffee habit and enjoy the endless wellness benefits from Nandaka from Peak. Now for a limited time you get 15% off plus a free starter kit and a bottle of Propolis throat spray when you shop the link you see on the screen or you can find it in the show notes. That's 15% off plus a free starter kit. Transform your mornings with Peak. That like phrase, you don't it. know what you've got till it's gone. Yeah. And then when they say, you know, when you hear people say, I'm the one that got away or that or she's the one that got away. He's the one that got away. Mm -hmm. It's like that begins with the walking away. There's a reason that you call people that. Mm -hmm. There's a reason you say she's the one that got away. And it's like you're thinking back to how great she was and you're thinking back to how great the relationship could have been but you're saying at a point where there's just no chance of it happening anymore but you're probably as you're saying it in a relationship with someone who could really be the next one who gets away because you're so focused on the past mm -hmm. and so yeah so when people say they always come back and 
the combating of it with how is that a compliment? Like you shouldn't take that as a compliment if they always come back. I agree with that. I don't think that you should take that as a now they see my value because how did they not see your value before? Why does your value only have to be seen in comparison to the value of someone else? Ooh. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I think people have to reflect on that. And so basically to you, you perceive that as you should have known my value when you were here. Mm -hmm. If you didn't see it, then what's changed? Well, that's that's one way to see it. But I know people who've gone through it. And when the person came back, they were genuinely a changed person. And one of my friends is actually now married with a kid with someone who actually did that. But when they come back to you, what work have they done on themselves? What's changed in the way that they're talking to you? Um, have they genuinely apologized to you for what they've done? Or did they just try to come back in and sneak their way back in and hope that you'll make all the apologies and accept apologies they never gave you and make all the excuses? What did they do during the time that they were far away from you? And are they now someone who you want to be with? And this is a beautiful way, actually, to figure out whether the person that you're with or the person that just came back from the dead who wants to be with you is someone for you. Imagine in five years or 10 years or in 30 years, you're talking to, uh, in 30 years, it would be that you're talking to your children or to your grandchildren about how the two of you met about your love story and how you decided to be together. Is the story that you have with this person one that you would be proud to tell in 30 years to your grandchildren and to your children and to your friends? You know, like a, a, a great story doesn't start with this person manipulated. <laughs> it doesn't start <laughs> with <laughs> this person abused the crap out of me. And mm -hmm. it doesn't start that way. That's not a great story. Yes, people change and yes, people help each other change, but it's very likely that if you are trying so hard to change how the relationship is or how the person in that relationship is, it's very likely that you are stepping outside of yourself to be the facilitator of that change. Mm -hmm. But then what about you? Don't you have a life to go on with? Why is all of your focus on changing the relationship or the person? The limits of your responsibility in a relationship, that's like that, where there's manipulation, where there's the silent treatment, where there's gaslighting, is for you to do the work to change what you need to change about yourself. You can't change another person. If they are willing to change, that's a different story. You can help them. I've seen couples heal together. I've seen couples consult e each other on how to be better communicators and how to be more present in the relationship. But if, if you're in a relationship where you, you genuinely have to, uh, like I'm thinking of a, of a car at a mechanic shop, like, like you, you have the car and it has no engine and you are the one who has to go and build that engine and you know make that car into a fully functioning one. If you have to do that in your relationship, like put the heart in the person that you're with or put the consciousness or the empathy or the communication into that person, that's, that's exhausting. It, you really do step out of yourself because you're like, why am I so invested in something that's so, it's, it's so out of alignment with who I am? Like, they don't fit in the puzzle of my life and I don't fit in the puzzle of their life. And I'm trying so hard to make that happen when they have no intention of doing anything differently. And many people get stuck in relationships for decades and some till the end of their life in relationships like that, where there's just one person in the relationship who's like, this is who I am. I'm not willing to do anything differently. This is how I'm going to spend my time all the time. And I'm not going to change anything for you. I'm going to live like I'm single, like I'm selfish. And you want to stay, stay. You don't walk away, leave. They'll talk to you like that. But many people who speak that way are, they're aware 
that speaking to you that way will play on your fear of abandonment and you're going to hold on even stronger. So your, your standards are going to start to become lower and lower and your expectations are going to become lower and lower. You're going to forget what the word needs means. You're going to forget what wants means because all your focus is on how you are meeting them where they are not where they are meeting you where you are or not where you are meeting yourself where you are. I had a woman, I wrote about this in The Only Constant, she reached out to me saying that she decided to get divorced after years of being with her husband. And she said that when she told her husband that she wanted to get a divorce, he told her, I think you're having a breakdown. And she said to him, I'm not having a breakdown. This is a breakthrough. And she said to me, she said, my whole life was all about him and the kids. She said, I don't even know what I like to eat. I don't know what my taste in music is. I don't know anything about myself. Everything I've done is to please him so that maybe he could see my value. But she said, maybe I am breaking down in a way, but breaking down the life that I thought I should be living, mm -hmm. breaking down the reality that I really am not happy in. So yeah, maybe there is a breakdown to break through that, that wall of, of, I can't have another life other than this. This is my life. I've accepted it. I'm married and I have kids and I can't walk away. And all these stories that we tell ourselves, you have to break through it. It has to break down. You can do that for yourself, but you always have to go back to redefining for yourself what it means to actually think of what is in your best interest and not look at it as being selfish because we are taught in relationships like if you're talking to a friend and you're like I have I have all these grievances like my partner doesn't listen they don't this they don't that and then your friend is giving you all these um, pieces of advice and then some friends or people will say you shouldn't think of what you're getting out of a relationship. You should think of what you're putting into the relationship. Because if you think of what you're getting out of it, then you're selfish. I do not agree with that at all. Because one of our most basic needs, and I feel like I say this in every single one of our interviews, is connection. If you're not getting connection in your relationship, you're not being selfish for being upset over that. You're not being selfish by saying, my needs aren't being met in this relationship. So you have to redefine for yourself what it means to think of what's in your best interest. And instead of looking at it as being selfish, you look at it as being self-aware. You look at it as being self-loving. You look at it as being a way to be the best version of yourself in that relationship. It's to be able to have that back and forth. But some relationships are just a one-way street. They're extremely transactional. I get one thing from you, so I'll give you something. But there isn't the genuine concern for each other's happiness and safety and well-being. It's extremely transactional. And do you think that that's what happened with this woman where when she spoke up, it's been this first time where she, because you said that she's lived her whole life taking care of the kids, taking care of the husband. And this yeah. first moment of speaking up is now A, changing that dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and then B, it's a different side where she's now thinking about herself and the husband may never have seen it. Yeah. And it seems like he was trying to put her in her place and shut her down by saying you're having a breakdown because let's face it, that is such a big manipulation tactic. It's like saying yeah. you're, you're just being sensitive. Yeah. It's like they you so use this language to make us yeah. feel like it's about us and it fucking drives yeah. me nuts. Or, or like... <laughs> Are you on your period oh, or, yeah. yeah, or did you watch something, this new guru who's telling you something? Did you go out with that one single friend who just wants you to be single like her? Like there's always a diversion and sometimes people do it out of being defensive. They do it out of not willing to take responsibility for their actions and also not knowing how to deal with their own emotions, right? You and I have spoken about this before, but I think it's worthy to bring it up here. 
when we say that the person who cares the least in the relationship holds the most power, or when we say that the person who shows that they care, that advice like gets under my skin. I've sadly met women who have said, I want to find someone that loves me more than I love them. Wow. I've heard that too. Find a man who loves you more than you love them. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with it. I think it comes from a place of deep, deep insecurity to want to be with someone only because they reject you or because they make you feel like you're not important to them. So that whole advice that's out there that's like, don't show them that you care and they will chase after you. Okay, well, let them chase after you. You're going to keep running for the rest of your life from them and from yourself. A relationship is about coming together. It's not about this push and pull where we're moving in parallels. You know, we can never come close because if we do and we open up to each other, then it it's just not going to work out. Like if I show you my true self, you're going to run away. And that's a real fear. I wrote about that in The Only Constant. I said, it's a very powerful sentence and I'm remembering it because I was recording the audiobook this week and it got me very emotional. Sometimes we don't open up to people and we don't show our true selves because we know that if we show them who we are, yes, they're going to see the beautiful things and yes, they're going to see the valuable things and yes, they're going to see why we're worthy of love, but they're also going to see all the ugly things. They're going to see the shame, the childhood trauma, the, the patterns that we've gone through. They're going to see our insecurities, our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, and that might make them want to run away and abandon us. So we would rather not show ourselves altogether than do that. And so it, you might be with a person who is that afraid to show you who they are, that you're looking them at them and you're perceiving it as, oh, this is a huge red flag. Mm -hmm. And you could have empathy for them and say, I see that they're not showing me any part of who they are. Like maybe at the beginning they would talk to me about things, but now they don't anymore. Because when you get close to someone, it's a lot scarier to talk to them about stuff. You can understand that. You can mm -hmm. know that to be true. But you don't have to step out of your experience and your story to sit with them in theirs. Because then you're abandoning yourself. Then you're saying the whole reason that they have completely shut down, the whole reason that they've covered themselves metaphorically and they're not showing me who they are and they're not communicating and they're not showing me their fears and they're not telling me they love me. The reason could be that they're so afraid that if I see those things, I'm going to leave. You could totally be in clarity of that. But you could also say, that's not for me. I want someone who's done the work, who's secure enough to say, if the person I'm with sees every part of me, including the ugly parts, and chooses to walk away, that's not for me. I'm okay with that. But I'm not going to completely hide myself and not be present in this relationship and not grow with my partner and not grow as a person for someone to say, I'm not going to do any of that because I'm scared that if I show them myself, they're going to leave. So in order for me to keep them in my life, I'm going to hide myself. Do, do you see yeah, how? Yeah. So people get confused sometimes. Like when they're sitting with their friend, their friends will say, I, I know he loves you. Like we, we all see it. He loves you. And you're sitting there and you're like, I don't feel it. I can't see it. And it's like, you're so confused because everyone is telling you they see it. You're so confused because you have felt it before and because you can sense at certain points that they really do want you there. They really do want to spend time with you. But you're, you know you're not feeling it. They're and not doing anything to so show badly. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with wanting it so badly. This whole thing of, Again, don't show them that you care. Don't bring up that it hurt you that they didn't communicate with you. Don't bring up that it hurt you that they stayed out all night and didn't call you or text you. No, show that. 
That's part mm -hmm. of becoming the person you need to become. In the only concept, there's one chapter about changes we need to make. And I put that chapter in there because I want people to look at the life they're living and the relationships that are in their lives and decide that they are going to actually change their life to one that they want to be living, a life that's authentic. We all know what we need to do. We all know which toxic relationships are in our lives that we need to just cut that cord. We all know that. If we are in a bad relationship, we know it. We know if we're in a relationship that's meant to last for decades and we know when we're not in one. And hope can be very damaging. Um, not only hope, but going back to the past can be very damaging. And saying, I've seen how they are able to be. I've seen how they are able to show up. If they can do it once in their life with me, they can do it again. But the truth is, in the present moment, they are choosing not to. So you have to make a choice whether that is something that you're okay with or that's something that you're not willing to endure. And I always say this to people, relationships are hard enough, life is hard enough. When you're together with someone, you have a child together, that child gets sick, that's tough. When, you're, uh, when your partner goes through an illness and, or your parent goes through an illness and, and you know, you're rallying around to support them, there's tough times in life and in relationships. The tough thing and the hard thing should not be that person loving you, choosing to love you, choosing to show up for you. That shouldn't be the hard thing in a relationship. That should be what makes the relationship. Mm. That isn't to say the relationship is going to be easy, but you shouldn't. No. Yeah. Oh, but the, the love part, the yeah. knowing you we're committed to each yeah. other, oh, yeah. that shouldn't be the hard thing. And if it is, because relationships go through phases, we can talk about it. We can work through it. People mess up. People lie. Sometimes people cheat and they stay together and that's fine. But if you are the person who is being treated with those things that are really hurtful to you, Please stop stepping outside of your experience and your story and gaslighting yourself out of your own pain, out of your own need for your partner to see the pain that they put you through. Stop saying, well, that, that couple got through that. That means I should. Or, or that couple's dynamic is like that. That means I need to accept the one I'm in. Look at yourself and really ask yourself if you're okay with it. Look at yourself and really ask yourself, what are the things that need to happen for me to continue to be with this person? Mm -hmm. So yeah, go through the tough times, but go through them together, not alone. Especially if you're not the one who caused the tough thing to happen. Don't take on that whole responsibility. You know, I feel like men and women are conditioned in different ways, for sure. Men tend to be a lot more I don't want to deal with this, I tend to be, I'm not going to make a no, generalization. Sure. And women tend to be ones that say, well, it's my fault that he didn't stay. And you know, you scroll through your phone and it's like, this is how you can get a guy to commit to you. This is how you can get him to not walk away. This is how you can be the one that got away. This is how you can make him ask you to be his girlfriend. There's so much of that advice. And it's like, it's putting the whole responsibility on you to get the person to commit to you. If we're going to strategize about how we're going to convince someone to choose us, that tells a lot about ourselves, a lot more about ourselves than it does about the people that we are attracting. Oh God, you are hitting on so many <laughs> things here, girl, that I just want to make sure that we really tie this together because you had said so many good things there. So first of all, on the, um, you know, how to get the guy, it is so freaking difficult for me to run a YouTube channel and make sure that I don't do that. And every time I read a headline, I'm like, does this make me feel like I'm desperate? If it does, I won't use it. Does this empower me? Great, then I will. It is so difficult on a day to day. So now think about what the language we use yeah. with each other, the language yeah. we use in our own minds mm -hmm. and why we end up getting into the situation where it's like, well, I should do this. I should people please. You even said about the selfish thing. Mm -hmm. And so how we end up getting stuck 
stuck is these small little things mm -hmm. that happen over time that then get us to a point where we feel like we're in a cycle and we get trapped. And actually have something that you wrote in your book, which I thought was fascinating. <laughs> you have like this little um, diagram and it's like how you go from being in a relationship and then getting stuck. And I'd love to break it down. So you said the bad behavior is directed towards you. Mm -hmm. You then want to leave. You then feel stuck. You mm -hmm. then don't leave. You then judge yourself for not leaving. Yes. You then justify the bad behavior in some way so you don't have to judge yourself for not leaving. Mm -hmm. Then the behavior happens again. Then you judge yourself for not leaving already. And it goes on and on yes. and on. The cycle must be broken. The judgment and the shame need, need to be taken away. Of staying with somebody that you even, that you know is no good. And to your point, which you even said earlier, that you know when you're in that cycle. Mm -hmm. Or you know when you're with someone, mm -hmm. when they start showing those red flags. Yes. And so you've got these stages of not knowing, feeling or thinking your relationship is one way, then realizing it's not. That's yes. already a freaking blow to mm -hmm. the ego, to the confidence, to everything. Then you see the flags. And now to your point of what you say is now you have to deal with the judgment of the fact that you've chosen to stay. Yeah. Like, how could I, how could I have gone through this? How could I have ended up with someone who is this toxic or manipulative? Like I know better and everyone looks up to me and people come and take my friends and family. Everyone comes to me for advice. We ask ourselves these questions like, how do I come out and say I went through this? Maybe I'm just, this is a test where I need to sh to show my strength and my resilience. And maybe, 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 maybe there is a way through this. And so you make the excuses and you try to understand them and you might start reading a book and you might start seeing a therapist and you might start following all the advice that tells you, you know, just spend time away from them. They'll come to you or, but everything that you're doing is centered on making sense of them. Everything you're doing is centered on how do I make that person turn around and change and treat me differently? So even though you are changing, you're not changing for yourself, you're changing mm -hmm. for them. You're changing for the relationship so that it could somehow work. Because if the option that you give yourself in that cycle, instead of going to the shame and the judgment instead of the staying part, there's another option that's giving yourself the compassion that you need until you're ready to leave. And you can say, I want to leave, but we don't go to that option because if we do, then we need to admit to ourselves that we were with the wrong person. We need to admit to ourselves that we accepted all the things that happened and all the time that we wasted and all the things that we invested in them and all the crazy stupid things that we did while we were in that relationship it's like it once you choose to end it it's like well all of those things that I did at the time I thought they were okay because it was an investment in the relationship but now that it's over it's like everything reveals itself as oh I was abandoning myself there I was really trying to please them there I was I was so stupid to pay for that thing or or I did that because I wanted them to see me differently and now now that it's over you start looking at everything and you 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 really judge yourself so there's a part of you that knows that that will happen once the relationship is completely over so you will do everything to avoid it being over so that you could save face in some way like it was worth it. Is there something that you've had in your life that you can relate to with this? Like, is there certain? Yeah, I can. I I can say that about past um, relationships or prospects of relationships mm. that I I've had in my life. Where back then I thought I was very conscious of the way that I was, but now when I look back, I'm like, I really did try to be the the good kind, quiet, like very successful, achieves everything, works hard, uh, handles it all so that this guy could see me as, you know, wife material one day or, or, and I don't remember being conscious of those things ever. But now when I look back, I'm like, yeah, I'm nice and I'm kind, but I was like 
overly that way. And I, I was that way also out of fear that if other parts of me showed like, like the person I am right now, the way I speak, not the, you know, you notice your body language, like, Hey, how are you doing today? Versus hi, Lisa, how are you doing today? The way I'm speaking right now. So when I, when I think back to that mm -hmm. person that I was, I'm like, I really thought I was a person of choice, but I wasn't. I was a person who allowed society and because I'm someone who's attracted to men and men to dictate for me what it means to be someone who's dateable or what it means to be someone who's marryable or what it means to be someone who's worthy of, of, of standing out uh, from other women. And now I look back and I'm like, wow, like I, we, we pit ourselves against each other. We compete with each other. That doesn't come out of nowhere. So yeah, in the past, I have um, invested in people in a way where I kept investing because I thought, well, there's, go there's going to be uh, an outcome at the end that's positive. There's going to be a payback at the end. And I, I'm not talking financially, obviously, sure, you know that. Yeah. There's something will come out of it. Like, this is how you, you get to know someone. This is how you build a relationship with them. And then I, I realized that that reflected a much deeper belief I had about myself, which is that I actually need to earn people's love. I need to convince them that I... I am worthy of them being in my life. And that, that was very self-abandoning. Mm. And at this point in my life, I'm so aware of that. I'm so aware of that inner belief. And I can sense when that dynamic is starting to come up. And so I always ask myself, am I doing this? Am I giving this love? Am I sending this message? Am I dialing this person's phone number out of, wanting to get confirmation that I deserve their love or am I doing it because I genuinely want to show them love and communicate with them and so there has to be that awareness piece inside of you where you ask yourself what is my intention of this little or big investment that I'm making in the relationship mm. right like here's another investment that people make in relationships having a child they think well if I if we do this, like we're that committed and that's a big show from both of us that we are committed to each other. And the truth is it's not. In so many cases, it's not. But those are examples of investments we make that we don't even ask ourselves if we actually want it, we do it for the relationship to stay. Mm -hmm. When really another simple option is that this relationship doesn't have to stay. You could go off and be with another person and they could go off and be with another person. With everything you just said, so it made me think about how as we're trying to mold ourselves to be something, right, that's mm -hmm. a, obviously a very big sign for ourselves of like, hey, maybe this isn't the right person because you're changing yourself to fit yeah. them. That's, I think, huge. I think as we do that, we, you've said it already, we, we abandon ourselves and yes. we start to lose who we are, which then prevents us from speaking up when something doesn't feel mm -hmm. good, from having the strength and maybe the confidence that we've built. And as you go deeper down that relationship, it becomes harder and harder, right, to speak up, to wave the flag, to then pivot, mm -hmm. because then you've molded yourself so much into being who they want. You no longer, you said it earlier, and I, I've used the phrase, like, how do you like your eggs? You no longer even know how you like your eggs yeah. because you just turn to the other person. Yes. Um, and a big sign of that from my own experience, I realized it was when things were very problematic in my, this was before I met Tom in my earlier relationship. Um, I realized that I wasn't telling the people that I care about what was actually happening. I wasn't telling my mm. mom. Yeah, you how, start hiding things. You start hiding yeah. things. And that is another sign mm -hmm. of that you're self-abandoning and that you're not actually absorbing I think is the truth I wasn't absorbing the extent to the verbal abuse that I was getting I was mm -hmm. just hiding and shying away from it and yes. it wasn't until in my adulthood that I started talking about it in public that mm -hmm. my mum came to me and my mum was like 
you never talk because my mum knew him, Aww. right? Because I would bring him yeah. home to meet my mum. Yeah. And, you know, I was 16 at the time. And my mum was like, you never told me. I thought you guys were great together. Mm. And I said, mum, it's not your fault. I chose to not speak up. And the reason was, is that I knew that if I spoke up, I had to address it. Yes, exactly. You know that if you say it, now you have to do something about it. Just like with that cycle we just went over, you know that if you choose the other option, which, which is to not accept this bad treatment and to not go the, down the road of the judgment and the shame and making excuses and whatever, the other option is that you say this is over. And so when it's over, everything kind of comes out in the open and it's this big messy thing that you don't want to deal with. When we are secretive, we don't tell the people that we love about a toxic relationship that we're in. Again, you need to be compassionate with yourself. Don't judge yourself for staying quiet or for covering up for that person. You're doing it to protect yourself because there is a fear somewhere that if this relationship doesn't exist, that something's wrong with you. Or if, this, if it comes to light that you went through this relationship, you're going to be judged for being not as strong as others would have hoped you, you were. If you find yourself being secretive after you give yourself that dose of self-compassion, just remember that there is someone in your life who cares enough to listen to you and sit with you in your pain. Mm -hmm. That's another reason actually why we don't end those relationships because we know that once we end them, there's going to be grief. And grief is heavy because you're not only grieving the relationship you thought you had. You're not only grieving who you thought they were. You are grieving past versions of you that sat through awful treatment and were quiet when you know that who you really are is someone who speaks up. You are grieving that little girl that you were. Now I'm getting emotional. <laughs> You're grieving that little girl that you were who started believing that she didn't deserve love or that being spoken to in a toxic or manipulative or putting you down kind of way is something that she deserves. You're grieving who she was then and the way that she looked up to you waiting for you to save her. And you feel like you're letting her down. You're stopping yourself from ending that relationship because you know you're going to have to deal with all of this. You know you're going to have to answer younger you and say, I know I told you that that will never happen again. And it did. You know, you know you're going to have to tell her, I need you to trust me again. I know I asked you to trust me before, but forgive me for not being able to uphold that promise that I made, but I will save you. It's hard to go through that. I'm talking about it and I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, but to actually go through it, it's tough. So don't blame yourself and judge yourself for not getting to the point where you're like, that's it, it's over. Because there is a mountain of grief that's going to come. There's a mountain of <laughs> holding yourself responsible for all the changes that you need to make in your life genuinely and telling yourself, we're going to be different moving forward. There's a mountain of work that needs to be done. There's a mountain of patterning that needs to be done. And when we're in romantic relationships, this is really important. I think people overlook it. It reminds you and brings up all the patterns from your childhood and with your parents. So sometimes when you're in a romantic relationship, you think that's it. That part of my life is over. I don't need to deal with it. But you understand that the reason you ended up in a relationship like this is because you didn't deal with mm. this. And so part of moving on from a romantic partner could also be moving on from the toxic family dynamics that you had, breaking those trauma bonds. If you had a parent, a mom, a dad, who constantly spoke down to you, 
and constantly made you feel like you needed to do more to earn their love and constantly spoke to you in a way where something was wrong with you unless you followed their rules and you ended up with someone like that, when you are thinking of leaving that person, that's a great time for you to think of this bond that you have with that parent of yours. Well, do you think, sorry to interrupt you, this is like a really aha moment for me. So do you think that partly sometimes if you've become, if you've in a relationship that somewhat echoes your childhood, if you break up in that relationship, actually now you have to deal with all the shit that came with it. And that's yes. including you have to, the, because your that's the root of it. Yeah, that never, it never dawned on me that that can be a subliminal hesitation of why you should, why people hesitate to leave the relationship. The fact that they have to now almost, let's say you leave the, the, the toxic partner, mm -hmm. let's say you have toxic parents, you almost then have to address that. Absolutely. And then maybe distance yourself from them too. And because sometimes, how could you do both, right? How could, oh, sorry, how could you do one and not the and other? And not the other. And sometimes oh. you have to, Go to your relationship with your family and address it or end it mm. or start setting boundaries to empower yourself to leave or address mm. or set boundaries in this relationship. Because our, our attachment wounds, our abandonment wounds come from our family. They come from our childhood. That's the root of the issue. So it's not this relationship didn't come about out of nowhere. This dynamic didn't come about out of nowhere. There was something that made the ground fertile for it to be toxic and made the ground fertile for you to accept that toxicity. There's one thing I say in The Only Constant, don't negotiate your change with people who want you to stay the same. If this relationship you're, you're planning on leaving, if the people who come to mind are your parents and what they are going to think. They're going to judge you. They're going to this. They're going to that. They're going to tell you, you know, people in our family don't get divorced or whatever the message that you're going to get is, or people in our family don't, don't go through something like that. Like just hush, hush about it. You don't negotiate your change. The thing that you want to do, the leaving, the ending, the going out and dating other people with them. If they want you to stay who you are, if this version of you actually serves something for them. Sorry, yeah, you wanted to say no, something. No, they're, so, they're so strong. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've so, I mean, I've done so many interviews now where I've told, uh, you know, spoken about like childhood trauma yeah. and how that leads to decisions when you make, like I, I knew all of that, but there was just like one little bit of piece yeah. of the puzzle that I was missing. And it's the subliminal subconsciousness of why you may stay in a relationship because then you have to address your parents or your childhood. Um, or the other way around is like, well, to your point, like when you're setting boundaries, how can you set a boundary with someone you're with if you're just then going home at Christmas or whatever? And you're and, enmeshed with and them. You're, yeah, and yes. now that boundary doesn't exist. Yes. That is so strong. That hit me really hard. Because you're changing at your core level. You're changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's like mm -hmm. you, you can't move forward with this change unless it, applies to everyone in your life. You can't push past this fear unless you push past your fear about the way that your parents might react at how you are now changing. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can do it, but if you are at that point where you, you're just sick and tired of being the way that you are and you really wanna change your life, there is a part of you that's like, I know that when this relationship ends, that relationship is also going to end because all of that frustration is coming up saying, why were you okay with me being treated that way? Why did you teach me that it was okay for me to hear words like that or to be made to feel like that? All of that anger and resentment comes up. And I want to tell you a story about resentment that I think you're going to love. I've never written too much about my relationship with my family, but um, there is a story I wrote about in The Only Constant, and I call it the airplane story. So uh, well, back when I decided to take my hijab off, my parents struggled with that decision. And I know they were worried about me. I know they, they had their reservations because it's a huge change. You know, I'd worn it since yes. I was 13 years old. So I remember the first time I brought the topic up, like my dad said, don't even think about it. 
And obviously that was, I don't even think that was something he thought about. He just said it. And I understood over time, like bringing the topic up here and there, that he was concerned that maybe I'm going through an identity crisis or something. Like maybe this isn't a real choice that I'm making for myself because of my convictions. Maybe I'm trying to please the internet or maybe I've been influenced by social media and that shows a, a weakness in character. And, you know, my dad is big on that. So when I took it off, I had already moved out of my parents' home. And so, yeah, there was a little bit of untalked about tension and distance. And so one day my mom called me and said, your dad wants to talk to you. And, you know, I was a little bit worried because, you know, my dad wants to talk to me, <laughs> even though I was 28 at the time. But it's my dad, oh, you sure. know, it's the man I'm Greek Orthodox. I right? get it. It carries a lot of weight. Yeah, it's, it's the man I've wanted to please my entire mm -hmm. life. It's the man I wanted to love me my entire life. It's, you know, I, I care a lot about his opinion. So I went over and we were sitting at like opposite ends of the couch. And he said to me, you know, when you first told me about your decision, I was worried that maybe you're going through an identity crisis, like a shakiness in your character. And, you know, I thought you're at the beginning of your writing career and people are getting to know you this way. And this maybe reflects a little bit of, you know, lack of conviction or you don't know who you are. He's like, just like when, a pl and when an airplane is taking off, it's very important that it's very steady and that there is no shakiness. Like the littlest mistake could cause a crash or a malfunction or something. But now that I thought about it, you're already up in the sky. You've already taken off and you're up there among the stars. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I don't get moments like that with my dad ever. Like, Just every few chills. years. I know, I know. <sighs> and I cried about this story so many times because, because of how rare moments like that with my dad are. Like, it's like, oh, it's somewhere inside of him, but it comes out somewhere, you know, every few years, I'll see his heart. I'll see his love for me. I'll see his admiration for me. And then after a while, as I was thinking about this story, a little bit of resentment came up because I was like, why do I have to work so hard? Why do I have to push through a decision that I make for myself? on my own and while feeling like everyone around me is looking at me as a rebel and I'm doing something wrong and it's only when I get there and I do it and I'm like, I don't care what you guys think, that I hear words of appreciation, that I hear words of love. Like, why do I have to work so hard for moments like that? That resentment came up. You have to deal with those resentments with your parents. You have to. If you don't, there's always going to be that you're either going to completely push them away and say, I, have, I, I want nothing to do with them. Or there's going to be a continuation of that dynamic and you're constantly going to feel like you're, you're the one who's plunging yourself back into it and you're going to judge yourself because now you're an adult and you're aware and you know that you don't want that dynamic and you're like, why do I keep going back? Well, you keep going back because it's your family. Of course you want their love. They're the first people who taught you what love looks like. Of course you want a connection with them. But if you want that relationship to stay, you have to work through the resentment. And if you want that relationship to change, you're going to have to decide what you're okay with and what you're not okay with in, in that relationship that you have with them moving forward. But it is not 100% your responsibility to keep the relationship in place. And here's what I mean by that. You know how they say um, some bridges are better if you burn them or never burn a bridge because you never know if you have to cross it again, right? So imagine that this relationship that you have with your parents or with your partner is one where you're at opposite ends of the bridge. If you are always the one who has to cross that bridge fully to get to them, that's not a relationship. That's a conditional relationship. And 
by crossing the bridge, it's not about just, you know, I'm going to visit them. I'm the one who's, no, it's having to leave yourself and who you are to meet them where they are and to meet the version of you that they welcome, the only version of you that they welcome. So are you always the one who has to stay within the confines of the rules that they set for you? And if you don't, then they accuse you of breaking the relationship. It's like, are you choosing to change your life for yourself or are you choosing to break your relationship with that person? Oh, you might have to do both. Right? You might have to do both. But, but if you are making a choice for yourself, for your life, and the accusation from them is you have broken your relationship with me, you can look at that and say, I actually just made a decision for myself. You're the one who chose not to accept right. this new me. You're the one who chose not to accept this me that made that decision. So, so that's what I mean when I say it is not 100% your responsibility to keep that relationship and to always cross that bridge. They have to somehow sometimes come to you and they have to sometimes meet you in the middle or somewhere. They have to be willing to, if, if you want to continue having a healthy relationship for them that doesn't break you apart and force you to live inauthentically you're going to have to look at them and 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 be really real with yourself about whether they have your best interest in mind or if they're always thinking about themselves and how your decisions for your life reflect on them mm. If you're not feeling strong and healthy on the inside, it's nearly impossible to show up and crush your goals and dreams. Take it from me. I ignored my health for so long and it had such a negative impact on my life, my confidence and my self-esteem. And that's why I want to tell you about Joy Women's Wellness. Joy Women's Wellness helps women like you and me take control of our well-being so we can feel like us again. Joy Women's Wellness will do a simple blood draw and then give you a super in-depth functional health report and together with your clinician you can come up with a game plan for how to balance your hormones get your energy back and start sleeping through the night so prioritize your health and just feel better from the inside out click the link below and run over to joy to get your levels checked right now and guys if you use my coupon code they're going to give you 10 percent discount so you can go and get started that's choosejoy.co Dude, this is so strong. And as you were talking, I was like, it's interesting how it almost like you could replace uh, parents with partner. Like you yes. can literally just keep flipping yeah. it and the same actually goes. And I remember um, when I was, uh, when I was obviously, I've been married for, uh, with Tom now for 21 years. Wow. And the thing that everybody asks, thank <laughs> you, everyone either says, oh, you're really lucky, which is obviously bullshit. I just laugh yeah. at that. Um, and then people say like, what's the key? Like, what's the magic? Yeah. I used to say communication and then realize actually it's not communication. It's a growth mindset mm. because we are always growing. So the question is, does the person you're with respect your growth or try to resist your growth? Yeah. And when you're with someone that respects your growth and you're growing and they're growing, no matter what happens, no matter what change is made, no matter whether I, for me, I go from a housewife to now, you know, owning mm -hmm. my own business with zip, not wanting any children. How do you accept that? How do you accept you get married to someone who says they want four children, you know, has these dreams and then completely pivots? Comple I completely changed mm -hmm. my tune on yeah. Tom and he still accepted me. Why? Because we have prioritized growth. Yes. And so the second to your point of that, if you're having to keep crossing that bridge, you have to keep going to the other person. And that if you don't, are they going to come to you? Yes or no. Right. That kind of like that communication. And yeah. That it is so imperative to find somebody who is willing to always go, oh, you no longer want to cross the bridge. You want to walk it? Let's do it. You want to go around the block? Yeah. Let's do it. That person that can accept you for all the changes that you're mm -hmm. doing, that to me is literally the biggest key yes. of any relationship because no matter who you want to be or what you want to become, are you with somebody that can accept it? Yes. Yes. You should be with someone who celebrates you when you achieve something. You should be with someone who celebrates you when you are happy about something. When you get that one thing that you've been really wanting, an acceptance letter or an interview or uh, 
just you get into a program that you've been trying so hard to get into or they should celebrate you when you wake up one morning and you say that thing that I've been carrying for so long I'm just I don't feel it anymore they should celebrate with you when you feel like you've moved through stuff when you feel like you've become a better version of yourself they should celebrate with you when life goes in a way that opens doors for you many partners feel insecure about that if you are growing they're not going to celebrate you they're going to feel threatened by that success because it might take you away from them or because you might actually believe that you deserve so much more than whatever it is that they have to offer you and that you might walk away and that's all really a story they're telling themselves because your successes are not about that they're about you and your life so notice whether you are with somebody who celebrates you or somebody who like you said resists you, your growth or resists your change or resists these big great things that are happening in your life resist seeing them as great things especially let me just add one more thing to that the real i hate to say test but let's face it yeah. it's a te- the real test is when you grow and change yeah. and it is um, a disservice to the other person yes and they still celebrate you mm-hmm. like when i saw told tom i cooked i cleaned for him i did everything for him he would wake up his clothes were next to him he would walk out the door i'd give him his lunch like everything and then i said Literally one day, you know, we're starting a new business. Sorry, you're on your own. You're cooking and cleaning for yourself, period. Like like, It was like completely different. I made his life worse. Like whether I should or shouldn't, not not having your food cooked for you, not having your clothes cleaned for you is, you know, more of a hassle. So I made his life worse by changing. And yet he still celebrated me. He still tried to uplift me. He still wanted to help me. And I think that that becomes, and vice versa, are you willing to help your partner as they grow, even when it becomes detrimental to your daily life or when even when it becomes difficult to you? What is your answer? Do you help them or do you back off? Mm-hmm. I was going to say, Tom obviously accepted that and celebrated your growth because he does genuinely love you as a person. So step outside of yourself and let's say your partner came to you and said what you just said i'm not i'm not able to do all these things that i used to do for you instead of immediately thinking oh that takes this away from me or think if my niece or my nephew or that friend of mine that i really love made that decision for themselves would i be happy for them if the answer is yes then you should be happy for the person that you supposedly love so much but i think what often happens is especially in transactional relationships it's like oh i'm not getting that from you anymore so because i used to equate your value with what i was getting from you i no longer see Mm. that value and that's why you'll hear many people tell i i'd hate to say it but it's it's mostly said to men like you need a woman who wants to stay at home. You need a woman who's comfortable cooking and cleaning and whatever. There there are some people who still think that way. And and you know, if if your woman is constantly out working and uh uh focusing on herself or whatever, like she's selfish and and women are put in a position. That's that's why we carry so many roles and we're like I need to do it all. I need to be able to cook and clean and go after my education and build a career and and be the, the, the one that never inconveniences anybody else. But at the end of the day, if your partner expects you to give, 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 give to them, and if that giving goes away, they just, they can replace you, then they didn't go after you. They went after what you were giving them. Mm -hmm. So they will go and find that thing somewhere else. Okay. On this note, Mm. there's something you wrote in your book that 
literally uh, completely is the opposite to how I believe. And what I love, Ooh. I love, is when I get pushed on my belief system. Okay. <laughs> so, and you don't know this either. I haven't even told you yet, this yet. So I am very much of, I look at my past relationship before Tom yeah. and I look at him, he was very verbally abusive. He was extremely toxic. Uh -huh. Like he, he was, I mean, I was very young as well. And so I yes. was very uh, malleable mm. into believing everything that he said. I didn't have the language that we use now. And so, in hindsight, looking back, for me to be able to let go of that, to not really hold on to the 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 bad memories that I very much have, you know, with what you know, they feel like they're kind of like burnt into your soul. Yes, it, they, uh, they feel yeah, that bad. Yeah. In order for me to get past it, I used to tell myself something, and I used to tell myself it's not personal. Mm, yeah, I and love I that you used, brought this up. <laughs> and so I was like, and here's the thing, in saying it's not personal, it actually really helped me to heal. Now, okay. and the, what I meant by that is Lisa, they would have done it to any other, he would have done it to any other young girl mm. that he could manipulate. So it's not you, Lisa Billu, obviously my name back then yeah. wasn't Lisa Charalambas, <laughs> it's not you it's him trying to find someone. You just happen to be somebody that he chose. Mm. I found it very pow empowering to say it's not personal. And then I got a quote of yours that you wrote in your <laughs> book about this. Could it be that the reason you convince yourself not to take it personally is that your body wants to avoid the pain you would feel if you actually gave yourself the right to feel the pain of that mistreatment? Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> I challenged you, Lisa. You did, Good. and and it was it hit me very hard. Yeah, it was. I'm alleviating the pain of that mistreatment by saying it's not personal. Yes, you are avoiding feeling the pain because you know if you feel it, there's something that you have to do about it. You know that if you feel it, there's a discomfort that's going to come with it. So I hear this advice all the time. Don't take anything in life personally. And I would look at that and think, wow, that sounds peaceful. Like if someone yells at me or swears at me, I can just say that has nothing to do with me. It's about them. And so I was having this conversation with my therapist about that. Like maybe that would help me if I don't think take things personally. It's been wonderful for me. Right. But now you're at a distance from it. If you were still in it and your partner was verbally abusive towards you and every time he was verbally abusive, you were just like, that has nothing to do with me. But, it, but he spoke that way to you, to you. Just because the intention of a person who, I always use this analogy, uh, the intention of a person who aimed an arrow at you has nothing to do with you. It's their own insecurity. It's their own willingness to inflict pain. That doesn't mean the arrow, the arrow didn't hit you and didn't cause you pain. Doesn't mean that you're going to have to, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to go through taking it out and going to the hospital and mm -hmm. getting stitches or it still hurt you. So you can take it personally. You should take it personally when someone who is supposed to treat you with the utmost love and respect doesn't. That hurts. So when you're like, you put that bubble around you of like, nothing ever hurts me. I don't take anything personally. I only judge myself based on my own decisions. And that's what I'm defined by. That makes for a very lonely life and for a very guarded and sheltered life. It's actually the same thing that happens when you're with a partner who is very defensive. Because... You say something to them, you know, that thing you said yesterday really hurt my feelings. And if they, if they were willing to sit with you in that pain that you are feeling as a result of what they said to you, it requires of them to take responsibility for what they said. But not only that, to understand why it's so hard for them to take responsibility. And that is sitting on a mountain of mm -hmm. shame and conditioning and going back to their childhood and thinking to the times when they were made to believe that if they were vulnerable in any way, that made them weak. And so instead of them sitting with you in that pain, they say, I don't want to deal with all of that. 
I'm just going to tell you something's wrong with you and something's wrong about the way that you think of things. So the same mindset behind don't take anything personally so that you don't feel all of that is the same reason that someone gets defensive. It's the same reason why someone uh, gets, uh, they would rather be verbally abusive towards you than show you the love that you need in that moment because they have to understand why they're not able to give that love. And that's a lot for them to deal with. You don't take, you think that not taking things personally is better, but it's because you don't want to deal with all of that. So you would rather um, go and speak to your friend about it and say, can you believe he said that to me? And can you believe that, you know, uh, it, he must be going through something. But here you are stewing with that pain inside of you and you're just waiting for someone to tell you how does that feel there were times when I would say to myself that I'm not going to take that person that has nothing to do with me and literally the moment hours later or days later that someone that I love asks me how does that feel that sounds awful then I'm in a puddle of tears because I'm feeling, I'm like, that was really hurtful. And do you think that's because also someone else validated the pain? So yes, now you're someone just like, else oh. saw the pain that's inside of you that you thought was wrong because if you are someone who doesn't take things personally, then you won't feel that pain. That's what we want to condition people to leave when we, to believe when we give them that advice, but it's very harmful advice. So if you've heard this before, don't, don't take this personally. Change that to take things personally. Because it's only when you take things personally that you are able to walk away from places that aren't for you. It's only when you take things personally that you're able to feel the pain, the anger, the frustration, the just going through that moment where you're just like, I just don't want to do this anymore. It's only when you feel the pain of what just happened that you are able to get to the other side. Would you say the same thing for, let's say your partner um, cheated on you mm. and betrayed you? Would yeah. you still take that personally? Absolutely. How do Absolutely. you do that without like totally wrecking your ego, like your self-esteem? So taking it personally doesn't mean that you sit there and you're like, oh, it's my fault. So how, so how do you separate the two yeah. then? Taking it personally does not mean you say, what was my part in this? Like, I'm the one who caused this or it's me. I'm not pretty enough. I don't have that body type that my partner likes. That's not what taking it personally means. Taking it personally means... You look at the behavior that they just did, that they chose to do. You look at the words that they just chose to say, and you say, you said that to me, that hurt me. You did that to me, that made me feel betrayed. That's what taking it personally mm. means. So you separate those two. So when someone that you love cheats on you, set aside the story that says, I caused this for myself. There's enough people out there who are going to blame you for your partner cheating on you and say, well, you never wore makeup. You never did this. You never did that. You always complained. Don't be one of those people for yourself. Be the one who actually sees your story and your experience and says, I actually don't believe that being in a relationship with someone means that I always have to be fun and pretend like I don't care about things and just I'm not going to step into that. I'm going to say that this bond that me and my partner had, it was on a foundation of trust and loyalty and being there for each other and never hurting each other in that way. And my partner just did something to hurt me in that way. And that hurts. Taking things personally isn't about blaming yourself. It's about seeing reality for what it is and for helping them take responsibility and accountability for their actions. It's and you about feeling that emotion yeah. that has caused you. Yeah, because we are made to believe that if someone hurts us, they have so much power over us. Mm -hmm. If someone, if their actions actually hurt us and we show that their actions hurt us, then that must mean that we are so weak. Like, like, 
get up and and remember who you are and how strong you are and how beautiful you are and you can go out there and find another person. That's not what you need when someone that you love just betrayed you. You need someone to look at you and say that betrayal that you're feeling in your chest that's making you feel like you're going to suffocate, that, that betrayal that you're feeling in your mind that's just circling with all these questions. How did this happen and when and how did I miss this? And it's not, you need someone to look at you in that pain and in that betrayal and what you're experiencing and say, that must really hurt. I'm sorry. You don't deserve that. Let's talk about it. What does that bring up for you? How does that make you really feel? Like it's, it's not about let's get up and let's go get dressed and go to a party and maybe you'll meet someone else. You're numbing that way. It's the most beautiful thing to be able to sit and tell yourself, I just went through something really awful and I'm going to need some time to recalibrate my understanding of who I am and to recalibrate my life with this new reality that someone who I never thought would betray me in that way actually betrayed me. To be able to sit with that pain and with that discomfort, not only will it bring you closer to who you are and to who you're the best version of yourself is somewhere in the future. But also, if you are planning on staying with this person, or if you are planning on ever getting into another relationship after that with another person, it prepares you to be the best version of yourself in that relationship, in this new one that you're building with the person who betrayed you or with the person in the future. It's necessary to get through the pain and you don't get through the pain if you don't sit with it and feel it and cry it out and I always give this analogy of it, it's hard for us to feel the pain because you're like I don't know when it's going to end I'm scared that if I start feeling it that it's just going to bring up so much if for you me open the floodgates and, and it won't stop yeah so so you'd rather say I just as I'm saying this, I, these videos that I see on social media are like replaying in my head where you hear people tell stories and say, I found out that my partner cheated on me and I was just like, OK. And, you know, I, I walked out and I did my own thing and that just never hurt me. I'm so much better than that person, whatever. I hear stuff like that. And I know that beneath that there is there is a gaping valley of grief that's untouched that needs to happen. Because if you loved that person that betrayed you, you are going to be in pain that they're no longer in your life. You are going to be in pain that they are not who you thought they were. You are going to be in pain that this relationship that you thought you had isn't what you actually thought you had. You will feel that if you are in touch with your emotions and if you are willing to just feel What's the difference? I've heard you talk about dirty and clean pain. Yeah. Talk to me about that. <laughs> dirty pain and clean pain. So clean pain is when you go through an experience like someone cheated on you and you actually go through the stages of feeling that pain. You go through the stages of grief if you walk away from that person or the stages of grief over the, the relationship changing. Maybe they're still there, but you grieve the dynamic that was there that now needs to be worked on. So you deal with it in a way where you don't make it mean something about yourself. You don't say, of course this would happen to me, or this always happens to me, or I deserved it because, you know, I, I was very neglectful maybe there. Maybe I took more care of the children than I took care of my partner. Maybe you start blaming yourself so that that's dirty pain is when the the pain that you're feeling is it, it it's like imagine like playing in the mud and you're wearing white and it doesn't matter what you do or where you go you're going to get dirty so dirty pain it kind of persists until you decide to step out of it and say I'm not doing this to myself anymore it's it's also in avoiding feeling the pain that's also dirty pain because you're still feeling it you're falling asleep at night feeling it. You're having dreams about it. You're waking up in the morning miserable. But it's because you're not willing to actually 
deal with it. You're not willing to actually feel it, but it's there. You know the people that you meet where you feel like they have a dark cloud about like every single time that you talk to them, you get more depressed about your life because they're they're always uh, just, you know, they're going through something, but they're not saying anything about it, but it's coming out in their words, like the way they treat people. It's not very nice. It's not very kind. They're very down about life. Any opportunity that they get, they will uh, just talk about like, what's the point of even living? And I'm just living because I'm alive and one day my life will be over and I'm just getting through the days. You meet people like that, those people are dealing with dirty pain. That's there, that's messy, that's, uh, again, they're, they're thinking maybe if I move around in the mud, it will get better, but you're in the mud. You're going to have to choose to step outside of it. Stop complaining about the fact that you have to deal with this pain and deal with it. That's the clean pain part is you, just like Dr. Gabor Mate talks about it, like you're open, you're vulnerable. You say this really hurt. You say this brought back stories from my childhood where I was neglected in a way and I'm, I'm, I'm healing that younger version of me. That's clean pain because it feels like the more you feel the pain, the more you're releasing it from your system. You're not just playing around with it and getting yourself just and getting all aspects of your life dirty with it. Like that new job came in. Well, it's not going to work out because everything else in my life didn't work out. That's living through dirty pain. I love the language behind it because mm. even as you're talking, I was like, oh, this would be really useful that when I'm feeling pain to ask myself, am I living in clean pain or dirty pain? Because mm. to your point is that clean, I think, is propelling you forward. It yes. allows you to handle it to then move past the pain. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking to move past the pain. But sometimes you maybe you don't realize you're in the dirty pain. And that, to your point of the way that you just your analogy with the white pants and stuff, I was like, mm. I was like, that was really <laughs> hit me really powerfully because you're right, is that you you can't get clean until you actually get out of it. And so you have to stop doing the dirty pain. Yeah. And I think so many of us naturally, our inclinations is to go naturally to the dirty pain, not the clean pain. Yeah. Go out for a drink, go out with friends, yeah, numb it, exactly. just make sure your schedule is always full so that you never have to sit with the realities that you really need to face. That's dirty pain. And what happens is, I talk about this in the only concept, I think it's a beautiful analogy. When you have so many unresolved experiences and pains and traumas inside of you, and every time something happens in your life, instead of you actually feeling the pain in a clean way, you, you go back to like, oh, something must be wrong with me and whatever. When that happens, it's like you need to push all the past experiences that you went through before and the traumas so that you could like add that one thing on top. Mm -hmm. You need to make room for it. So you're, you're constantly pushing something down. So, you know, when people in yoga classes, you know, you hear the instructor say, take a deep breath and let it go all the way to your belly. I could never do that. Like literally I would be like, what? I can't, I can't bring my breath all the way down. I would feel like if I went like, my breath just wants to like, I need to exhale. And through working with my therapist and working on understanding why my body is the way that it is and why I get sick the way that I do and why I get the anxiety and the stress and all of that, I realized that part of the reason why I couldn't take in that deep breath is and part of the reason why I couldn't accept healthy love or look for healthy love was because there was so much that was there that over the years piled up that I was so uncomfortable with feeling my emotions that I immediately had to be like, nope, this is not for me. Mm. So if like a deep breath, if a if a deep, healthy love that feels so good, that's like telling me sit in a state of peace where you could take a deep breath and just sit with it and you're not constantly agitated. I couldn't take that in because I had so much unresolved stuff from my past that made feeling anything uncomfortable. So I made that connection between not being able to fully breathe in and having all those 
toxins in my body, the metaphorical ones, that made any new emotion that was wanting to come in be like, there's no room for you. Just leave. There's no, because if, if you're going to come in, we're going to have to get rid of all of this other stuff. So I could never, ever like just relax. And making that connection really changed my life. So I would feel like I'm suffocating if a new emotion came in. Genuinely, I would feel like I was suffocating. And, and I honestly think when I make the connection with clean and dirty pain, when a new emotion that I needed to resolve came on top of all of these, it was like, well, we'll just we'll, we'll push everything down and put it there and, and go back to the exact same story we went to every time. You know, I am somebody who, who is meant to go through all of this. I am somebody who, it, th these things are just going to always be part of me. But the clean pain was sitting there and looking at all of these things that were standing in the way of me taking in that deep breath and taking in that new emotion and saying, what do I need to do to resolve you so that you can leave me? Because you have no place inside of me. I don't want you there anymore. So resolving all those past traumas, looking at my, the role I took in my own relationships when I accepted a situationship, when I accepted uh, just waiting around for someone to maybe be like, oh, you're worth it. Let, let's, let's give you another chance or just hoping that that person will look at me in a way that's different if I wait around long enough. So I, I had to look at all of that and be honest with myself and say, even as I'm talking to you right now, I'm like losing my breath because those stories had a home inside of me for so long that now when I look at them with this new awareness, that's like, I understand I accepted that. I understand my self-esteem was so low. I understand my self-worth was so low. I betrayed myself. I abandoned myself. I did those things because that's my survival. But now as the new me, I'm not looking to survive anymore. I'm looking to thrive. So I had to give myself that understanding and empathy and say, that's okay that we dealt with all of that. Now we're not doing that anymore. There's no room for that inside of you anymore. So take the deep breath, welcome the new emotion, and, and, and live this life of yours the way that you want to, instead of continuing to be ruled by the past. Mm. So is that everything that we've been speaking about from you working through the pain, making sure that you don't sit in the dirty pain, that you go to the clean pain, making sure that you address childhood traumas um, and identifying all the language around the behavior of your past exes? Has all of that been exactly what has helped you be able to sit here right now and thrive and actually love life? Absolutely. That and being really honest with myself about my life and taking responsibility instead of continuing to sit in a place where I was waiting for someone to save me. One really powerful thing that propelled my life forward is to imagine going back to every single younger version of me who developed a certain belief about herself or who went through a certain kind of pain where she was feeling, feeling excluded or unworthy of love, imagining walking in to exactly where she was and extending my hand to her and saying, do you want to be here or do you want to walk out with me to save every single younger version of myself instead of waiting for someone else to save me now so that I could save her? Being the leader for myself instead of following someone else's footsteps hoping that they're going to get me to a great destination understanding that if I want my life to be different from the lives of those around me or from the lives that I was exposed to at a young age I have to do something differently because if I continue to fall for the same rules and expectations and the same manipulative tactics that are meant to keep me the same then I'm going to live that exact same life if I want to live a different life, I have to do something differently. If I'm going to live authentically, I'm going to have to choose differently for myself. I'm going to have to understand why it is that I have been living so inauthentically for so long. Telling myself that I need to be a chooser in my life, a leader. 
that that was huge. Going through all the decisions I would make in a day from what I ate to what I wore to the way that I spoke to my body language. Did I choose that for myself or was that chosen for me by someone else that I'm trying to please or whose approval I'm trying to get? Learning that in order to belong in a place, I need to be fully myself in that place. That's what belonging is. Belonging to a place doesn't mean that I hide parts of who I am to be there. That was a huge thing for me. So notice how everything I just said to you had absolutely nothing to do with the people around me. Hmm. It had everything to do with reflecting on myself and my life and the changes that I know I need to make. Because many of us want our life to change so badly, but we don't want to do anything to make that change happen. We don't want the discomfort of stirring things up, you know? There's one quote, and I think this is a powerful one for us to, you know, slow down at the end with. Murky water is best settled when it's left alone for a while. So the change that you're planning to go through in your life, the chaos that you're going through in your life, when you sit in that peaceful state of knowing that there is so much out there that's out of your control. The only thing that's in your control is to decide on who you want to be, to decide to fully become who you actually are. And you sit there and all that mess in your life, all the people who are meant to walk away because that's the best thing for you will walk away. As long as you're trying to change things, you're making the water murky. You're making your life murky. You're making your reality lack clarity. Sit back and focus on being your full authentic self. Be the person who chooses for yourself and let life be what it is. Let people walk away if they want to. Let them walk into your life if they want to. Let people betray you if they want to. Again, you're going to take it personally and you're going to say, you're not part of this. You're not part of this new clear vision that I have in my life. You're going to go down to the bottom of that life. You, you mean nothing to me because people like this don't exist in my life. So sit back and let your life settle and let your life become clear in front of you and trust that you will have the ability to build a new life for yourself that doesn't require all that mess and that murkiness that existed in your past. You can now choose who you want to be and where in your life. <laughs> Boom. My job, girl. You know how much I love you. I'm so I proud of you, you. Your book is phenomenal. And I mean, literally, you are a writing machine. You are changing people's <laughs> lives one video and one book at a time. Thank so you. So where can people find you in your new book, The Only Constant? So I'm everywhere on social media at Nejwa Zabian. And The Only Constant is a book that everyone needs to read if they're navigating any kind of change in their life, especially the change that they need to make to live an authentic life. So you need to read The Only Constant. You can find it wherever books are sold. It's out March 5th. If you want to learn who to actually walk away from before they ruin your life, keep watching. The first betrayal I ever experienced, I was like 17. So I was grounded because I was late. <laughs> my mom, my parents were very strict. when I, I wasn't allowed to have boyfriends until I was 16, no makeup. So when I was 17, I could go out, but my curfew was 10 o'clock. And if I was late, I was grounded for the weekend. No friends, can't go out. So I was late and my, I found out the next week at school that my two best friends hung out with my boyfriend. And I found out they had a threesome together. And I didn't find this out for about two or three weeks because at school, I was like, why, why are you being so weird? Like, what, what did you guys do over the weekend? And they're like, oh, we went and met up. We went to this party and did this and that. And so eventually the one friend, she's like, I just, I have to tell, like, I feel so bad. I have to tell you. So she told me that my one friend slept with him. And then I called that friend and she's like, well, Ash, well, she did too. <gasps> and I was like, you guys both, you guys all like, no wonder why you're all being weird. So that for me was the very first betrayal of two of my best friends and my boyfriend. So I like, my heart was ripped out. And I think that for me, I, I cut all of them off. I cried immediately, my, immediately okay. did not talk to any of them. I cried my eyes out and my mom and dad, I would 
just cried to them. And I was like, how could they do this to me? Like, you know, and that was one of the hardest experiences I, I experienced for the very first time all in one at 17 years old, so. Oh God, that's so heartbreaking. So how on earth, because you said you come off, which is amazing, I'm like, yes. Um, but you still then, right, have had other relationships after that yes. where someone has betrayed, I believe, was it Corey who you found naked women's oh, photos? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so tell me about that, if you don't mind explaining okay. that story, and then let's talk about how we can be strong in one area and then almost lose that strength mm -hmm. again when we get into a different relationship. It's so easy to, build that strength up and then it just be like, it just withers away. And when you don't even realize- you someone who's very strong. Yes, when you're, so when I was with my ex, he, you know, he was traveling a lot. I was working and on TV. So there was a lot of insecurities and jealousy and, and I started getting a lot of tweets from fans that he was making while well, he was on these tours that he would be making out with their friend at a bar in Oregon or Oklahoma, or they'd go back to his room at night. And the, these were messages from fans that loved me from the show that were warning me. And so I was like, this is so weird. I've never experienced like, this is so weird. And so I would tell him, and of course it would be like, they're just trying to break us up. No one wants us together. You're gonna believe a stranger over me. I would never do that to you. And so I was like, okay, like, but you didn't call me last night. So what were you doing? So it got to that point and then I would believe him because he was so, there's that charming, you know, like you want to believe him, you want it to work. So I believed it. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And then as time went on, when I thought things were really good for three or four months and we were the best we had been, then all of a sudden I, you know, he's at my house and he just got, gets back from tour and his phone's going off all night, all night. And I was like, who, he's passed out. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna pick his phone up. Like who keeps texting and calling like this? And I won't say the girl's name. So I picked it up and I saw, I was like, oh my God. So I knew his password. So I looked at it and I was shaking, like sitting there shaking. It was pictures of her like legs spread open, all everything. And their conversation was disgusting. And I woke him up and he said that I was a psychotic whatever for going through his phone, that I'm super insecure and get over it. Like saying that I wasn't giving him enough attention or I was with producers or going to events and I wasn't giving him what he needed. So it was my fault. And eventually, like I started believing it. And then I, we broke up and a few months go by, I leave, he leaves, then we're back in the same town again and we meet up and it's like, you have that excitement for the first time again. He's so nice and like he said he's changed and on and on and on. It's like, okay, well, it seems like you've changed. The first month or whatever is great. And then it's slowly those bad habits, it starts to happen again. Thank you so much for your rawness, by the way, and your vulnerability, like that's so strong because it doesn't matter who you are on television, not television, so many of us deal with these toxic relationships mm -hmm. that do impact us and then how we show up. And again, I'm going to keep saying this, losing our voice, that's so important to me mm -hmm. that women don't. And when it comes to matters of the heart, I notice that that's where most of us women start to unwind all the work we may have done to get strong, to mm -hmm. stand up for ourselves. And so when you walk away and you said that we had that time apart, were you telling yourself, okay, I'm going to be strong now? Like, yes. So how do you go from, right, then entering that relationship again, I'm going to be strong. You're like, oh my God, he's changed. And then it is that one little chip at a time, right? There's like one, mm -hmm. and then the months go by, and now you blink again, and you're the old Audrina again. Yeah, it's so easy to fall back into those old habits. I, and you don't even realize it's happening because you're so infatuated with just being in love and making it work and like wait but he's being so nice and i think he's really changed this time like maybe it'll really work and you know you you give them the benefit of the doubt they're telling you everything you want to hear they're doing everything you want them to and then slowly when you think it's amazing then you find naked photos or sex sexed messages or you know you go out and you start hearing things and you're like what and then that trust is broke and then you it's almost like feeling so humiliated and just 
am I not good enough? Or what is it? Is it me? Like, what can I do better to change myself so you won't have to do this? It becomes more about yourself than realizing it's not you. This is something that's going on in him that he has to heal from and he has issues. So you need to take yourself away from that situation and remember that it's not you, mm. like it's them. God, that self-worth piece is so powerful. Yeah. And over time in my own evolution, I've really tried to work on how do I make sure I bring my self-worth to myself, mm -hmm. that I'm not looking external because to your point, I want to be able to be in love with my husband and have a friendship where I trust them so much, I tell them everything. Trust is so, yeah. can build such a beautiful relationship, but at the same time, trust can be used as a weapon. Yeah. And um, you actually talking about it in your book, which I think is really powerful. I love that you said this, where you're like, you went to therapy. You're like, okay, let's do couples therapy. And then you're even worried that if I say to him, if I reveal my vulnerability, if I reveal my insecurities in this couples therapy, is he going to use it against me when I'm out of therapy, mm -hmm. when we're not sitting in this room? Yeah. And he did. Everything that I did reveal, every insecurity, every fear, everything I had been through, the good and bad growing up or through high school, everything, he would use to hurt me in fights or just use when he's in a mean mood or doesn't like something I'm doing to like ruin my mood or just to hurt me. It was all used to hurt. And that was another trust issue. It's like, here we go again. You know, it's, I had so many trust issues already just from being on TV and the people in and out of my life and even the producers of no, not knowing what's real and fake on the show or like if I could really trust them or what they said about me, is that real? Like, do you really hate me or did you like, there's so many trust issues. Mm. So with him in the beginning, I felt such a bond and like I could, I felt safe with him and I could trust him. And then it slowly started dwindling away. And then with going to therapy, trying to fix it, and I really gave it my all. Like if I'm gonna, I give my all, I pour my heart out. <laughs> Whoever I'm with, I don't jump into things fast, but I ease into it. And once you have me in my heart, like you have it all. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I was in 500% and I wanted to give it my all to try to make it work. And with going to couples therapy, I just thought maybe we could figure out figure this out for the sake of our relationship, our future, our child. And within doing that, I should have remembered that that's how he was. But I wanted to believe so bad that the therapy would change him and it would help him. But he didn't want that help. He didn't want the therapy. That was me forcing it and pushing it on him. So you, you have to be careful. What I've learned is you can't change people. They have to want to change and they have to go through life lessons and something to open their eyes where it makes them want to change and they have to want it. I wanted it, but he didn't. So that was the difference. Dude, that's so powerful because as you were telling your other story earlier um, about how you really want to trust them and you really think, oh no, he's come back and he says he's changed. Like I, before my husband, I was in a relationship for about three to four years mm -hmm. and exactly the same thing. It was like we would break up my heart. It's like I would feel like I'm getting stronger. He, I think, would see I was getting stronger, try and do everything to get me back. And yeah. he's like, I've changed. And what I've learned now is to ask myself the question, what have they done to change? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because he may have wanted to. Your ex may have wanted to change. Mm -hmm. And so if you say it enough, sometimes you can believe your own lies, right? So yeah. it's like maybe he even believed his own lie. Now, when they believe their own lies, of course, they're going to be able to convince you because they actually believe it. Yeah. So when I always <laughs> reflect on what would I do differently, because I like I'm always about that. Like I don't beat myself up over what happened in the past, but I want to assess mm -hmm. and recognize either yes. the red flags so that I can like put it in my intuition buckets, right? Like yeah. my, my tool belt mm -hmm. um, and then figure out what I would do differently next time. And so the trust piece is so powerful because it's like, of course you want to trust somebody. Of course, if someone says, look, I've changed. I think it can be beautiful to give someone space to change. Mm -hmm. But the question really does remain, what have you done to change? Exactly, and that's where actions speak loud and clear. Yes. Words are words. Like, I, I'm I can change or I've, I'm gonna change. I love you so much, I can't live without you. But then it's like, if you love me so much, you can't live without me, why are you cheating? Like, what, if, what am I doing wrong or what is it? How are you gonna change? Because mm -hmm. if you look at the actions, that speaks loud and clear and it tells you right there. Yeah. 
same thing I think applies with friends. So mm-hmm. was it the same kind of process where you started to trust friends again? Because you were even saying earlier, right, you were closing your circle more on that. And I think so many of us do that. But that's really the armor. Yeah. Right. That's really like maybe I don't even trust myself enough to give myself over to, or to, to know who to trust. So I'm just going to close my circle more and more. That way less people mm-hmm. can hurt me. Yep. And that's kind of what I started doing. And like you become isolated or well, at first in my 20s, I would just I was friends with everyone. Mm-hmm. Like everyone was my friend. I wanted to take care of every. Oh, let's all go on this trip. Let's all go on this plane. Let's do it together and then your circle grows closer. The circle of trust becomes very small. And and I've realized in what I've been through that I still have trust issues that I'm working through. And, you know, even every day I question people or their actions or I'm very observant and I sit back and I watch and I don't give as much. And especially like getting back into the dating world and and all of that, you know, it, I have to, I eased into it mm. and it took me a long time because I had been through so much and I also didn't want to be with someone where I was, they weren't able to handle me and what comes with me. So it has to be a very strong person. How are you working through then right now, the second guessing part? Because to your point, you even said like, I'm questioning and there's that part of me that's like, oh yeah, when you've been burned, you're questioning where the stove's going to be hot again, right? Because you don't want to get burned again. Exactly. So you're like, yeah. But how much of it starts to become a problem where you almost can't trust people when they are genuine? I know. And that's, I've actually have experienced this recently because in my mind, um, I'm thinking a certain way and I'm projecting it onto that person. Mm. And then it's almost insulting to them because they're like, I know what I'm getting into. Like, I like you. I would not be here if I didn't. So you need to trust me on that. And so that kind of opened my eyes where I need to stop projecting my fears and what I've been through onto other people Mm -hmm. and give them a a shot because it's like learning to trust again and to let people in. And there are still good people out Mm -hmm. there. You know, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Like life goes on. You go through these great moments, bad moments, but you take the good from it and the lessons and you keep moving forward. That's so true. And then one one thing I'd love to add to that is you almost sometimes have the confirmation bias because you've been hurt so much, Mm -hmm. you're questioning, right? So whether it's you're dating, whether it's a friendship, right? So it's like your friend, you've been burned by a friend before and now someone comes in your life, they may do something that your other friend did. So now you're just like, hang on a minute, I recognize that behavior. And now what you're doing is you're waiting for the other ball to drop. Exactly. And you're just sitting there waiting. Yeah. So now it's you're just waiting to confirm that you can't trust them. Mm-hmm. I don't let a lot of people in. And I know a lot of the friends in the industry are the same way. So I feel like we kind of connect on a different level because we all have the same issues <laughs> and an understanding. But yeah, with friendships, it's crazy because you do recognize little habits or things from other friends of the past. So you're like, hmm, like what are what are your motives? Why are you so why are you trying to be my friend so much? Mm. Or or you notice little things and it's like, I don't know. Now I have like my core group of friends and it's like, if I connect with someone and there's a chemistry that's undeniable, I've had with some of my best friends that were, my friend Brianna, who was, did my hair like 20 years ago. <laughs> my best friend Joey, who's a stylist. Like we had that instant friend chemistry and we're still friends to this day. Like sometimes you just know you're, you're brought to the right person. So it's like, you can't doubt everybody, but just look for the signs and you're smart. You've been through enough to where you know at this point. I love that people that may be listening, you did this with your mind. And that's kind of like, just keep thinking about it. Keep mm-hmm. looking at it. Like know that it's an evolution. I think that's really powerful because what someone may have done once upon a time, that behavior trait may not be in and of itself mean, cruel, um, but when you spot the behavior trait, maybe you sometimes get triggered, right? We're like, oh, yeah. hang on a minute. Yeah. The last person did that to yeah. me. What does this mean? Um, but I do think like not like being able to be, okay, well, that was the past and I'm going to learn from it. Yeah. So you've mentioned gut yeah. intuition. That's yeah. another thing I talk about a lot. Yeah. Oh, well, and that, and also like seeing something with someone that also kind of being triggered, that also is like, okay, well, this is my chance to set a boundary because in the past I would have never communicated my feelings or said what I wanted or what I was uncomfortable with 
or what was not okay. So this is your chance to kind of voice that and set that boundary. And if that friend or that boyfriend or whoever can't respect that, then there's your answer. I love it. How do you approach boundaries? Boundaries, oh my goodness. I mean, it's all about communication. I really have worked hard on healing and communicating how I feel and what I want and what is not okay. And sometimes there might be a question or a scenario that happens that I'm not cool with, but I don't react right away. I kind of have to process it and think about it like, okay, I didn't like this. Where is it coming from? What is the trigger? And what do I need a voice about it So the other person understands where I'm coming from. And then based on their response is kind of where the direction could go or like, you know, if we're meeting the middle somehow. And then you set that boundary. Or even if you have friends that call you and they're venting and you're not, you're mentally and emotionally not in a good place to take on all their heated conversation and it's like super heavy, you kind of have to learn how to kindly set, put your foot down and be like, you know, I. I really want to listen to you, but right now, like, I just don't have it in me to take on what you're about to say. So give me, like, let me call you back because I just, I'm not in the right place right now to take it on. I'm so wide-eyed right now because thank you for bringing that up. I want to go a little deeper here because this is so powerful because, homie, it's like, you, you care about your friends. You want to be there for your friends. Mm-hmm. You love your friends. And at the same time, we're sitting here saying, we've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to love ourselves. We've got to know our own self-worth. And if mm-hmm. we keep giving it, um, if we keep putting ourselves aside for everyone else, now we're teaching ourselves that we're not worthy. Mm-hmm. Then we end up getting in relationships or in a business where maybe somebody pushes you around, convinces yeah. you to take your top off when you're not comfortable. Mm-hmm. Right? Like to have a friendship that maybe it's fake. Like all of that is so powerful. But in those moments of that like i am so drained right now and it's incoming right and it's someone that you love Mm -hmm. in the past me myself included has just taken it on you just take it on and then after that call you're so depleted and your mood's different and you're just like whoa like that was a lot to take on so how have your friends responded when you've said that to them they respect it you know because you have a mutual respect for each other and what you're going through and what you can and even my sisters you know they took on all of that with my toxic relationship and afterwards looking back i was like wow you guys never hung up on me you always were there for me and i wanted to apologize to them for putting them through that over and over and over. And my friends, because they listened to it and would give me the same advice over and over, and they never shut me out, you know? But they could have been like, well, then, yeah. So my sister, Samantha, is very, like, she's all about healing and spirituality and everything. So she's amazing with that and setting boundaries and just letting people know that I don't like this environment. It's too much for me, so I'm going to go, but I'll call you later. You know, if she's around something or someone that's just, it's too much for her to take on. So she's very inspiring with all that too. What if it's a friend though that feels um, like they're being dismissed? I've, I've experienced that where sometimes they won't, they won't stop talking or they won't go and it's like, oh my gosh, like how many times do I have to say this before I'm going to end up sounding rude or just cutting them off? Then they're mad at you. It's a fine line and it's, you know, it's like you want your voice to be heard and you don't want to hurt that person's feelings, but sometimes you have to be loud and clear and just blunt. I know it's hard. (laughs) But here's the thing, (laughs) it is hard, but the fact that you're saying, look, it's hard, but you still got to do it. That's the gold right there, yeah. right? It's not that it's easy for you. It's not that it comes simply for you. It's that it's hard and you still do it. Yeah. And letting them know too that this is coming from a place of love and I'm being completely honest right now. All you could do is speak from your heart and it's coming from a good place. So as long as they know that, they should understand. If not, and they just keep going and going and going, they have no respect for you and your feelings. Oh, I love that. And there's one thing, like, you earn a reputation. So Mm -hmm. if you've been, like, an amazing friend for 10 years, and every time they need you, you're there, and then the one time you're like, hey, I actually need to be there for myself. And I actually had this situation with my sister, Mm -hmm. um, where it's like, you know, like, 
hey, look, if I can't be here for you right now, mm -hmm. it's not that I don't love you. It's like, hopefully, for the last 20, 30 yeah, years that I've been know. alive, <laughs> I've shown up for you. Yep. So the time that I am unable to, hopefully you understand that it's not a reflection of you. Mm -hmm. It's actually a reflection of me where I am right now and that I can be honest with you about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of people take things to heart and they always think it's about them. A lot of people talk about themselves all the time where they think if something happens or someone's in a bad mood, it's, what did I do? No, it's not always about you. Like, <laughs> I have to remind myself because I still naturally, yeah. automatically go, oh my God, what did I do wrong? I do, even now. I do too. <laughs> but again, I don't almost like, I don't know about you. I don't beat myself up over it though. Mm. I just go, oh, here we go, Lisa, making it about you. No, it may not be about yeah. you. To actually find out who it's about or yeah. what it's about. Maybe they're struggling and they mm -hmm. don't feel comfortable telling you. Yeah, it's just taking that step back and looking at the whole picture before you assess or like, not, not judge it, but like before you think it's about you or it's something that you did or even on an airplane, I'll be sitting there and I'm like, every single person here and I'll be looking at someone and it's like, I wonder what they're going through. Every person mm -hmm. has a different story and everybody has hard things that they're going through and they're hurting. And you know, some people have great things, but everybody has a little bit of hurt in them that you can relate to somehow. So it's like, be careful when you're so quick to judge someone or when someone's in a bad mood or you're at the grocery store and they snap on you. It's like, you don't have to snap back. Like maybe they just need love. Maybe they need a smile. It's such a fine line between like showing them the compassion when someone is rude to you and just taking shit. Yeah, <laughs> and that's like the kindness, you mistake kindness for weakness. Ah, there, it <laughs> there it is again. Full circle, girl. <laughs> um, it really is those nuances. I actually have a great quote of yours that I'd love to um, say because when I think of nuances, when I think of how we interpret things, sometimes it can be for the good and sometimes it can be so detrimental. Um, and you have a quote about jealousy. There's a fine line between affectionate and proud and being possessive and jealous. Mm -hmm. And when I think about what we're talking about even now, right, where the nuances are, there's massive nuance to that. And to your point, when I was super insecure, mm -hmm. my ex-boyfriend was super jealous and I was like, well, he cares about me. Yeah, I was the same way. You know, especially if he got super jealous or insecure about a producer that I was working with or other, you know, male co-stars or whatever that I was around, he would get so mad. And in my mind, it's like, oh, he really, really like cares about me. But then it starts, then it starts affecting your mental state and you can't focus and you can't work. And then you're worried, like, I'm not gonna, I'd, I'd rather just not deal with fighting or the accusation. So I'd rather just not do this job. Like, I'll just, I'll not accept it for the sake of that fight or to save a fight or that relationship. And that's not healthy. How would you process that now then? Oh my goodness, it was so unhealthy. That was toxic. I think now if I was back in that situation, you know, it's, it all comes down to trust and security. Like if you don't feel secure in a friendship or relationship or feel that you could trust that person, then there's, there's no trust, there's no relationship, there's no friendship. It really comes down to trust mm. and Maybe there's things that are not being communicated to help that person feel like sometimes maybe all they need is a quick text. Like, I miss you or here's a picture like, hey, this is what we're doing. I'm so excited to tell you all about it. You know, just making them feel a part of. But then there is a fine line of, of that jealousy and that possessiveness that's not healthy. And some people, that's just how they are. That's not my cup of tea. So that's how you are. But that's not how I am and I don't like it, so. Yeah, then you yeah. literally were about to take that word out of my mouth because it's like, it's beautiful, right? Where you're just like, hey baby, I love you. Just reminded, maybe I'm not saying it enough because yeah. I am so the person, like I have to look inwards first. Mm -hmm. Like, am I showing up and giving that person that love? And they do they feel like um, they're respected and loved by me and things like that? Yeah. And at the same time, making sure you're not pushing yourself so much to try and validate it because they can't, they have got so much insecurity and now what you're doing is just feeding the beast exactly and then you're everything that all consumes you and mm. it's all about making sure they're happy all the right. time 
and then you lose yourself. You start depleting and your happiness slowly starts going away and your life and what you want and what matters about you is not, it doesn't matter anymore because it's all about that person. Yeah. So I think it, with this sort of thing, when it comes to like the nuance, I would definitely look and go, um, is this true? I'm always asking that question, right? Uh -huh. Because it's like immediately I always want to put my defense up and say, it's not me. Yeah. You know, yeah. so like I'm, I'm, that's something I've worked on a lot. Like, yep. okay, pause. Is this true? And then really assess because if you want a relationship to work, if you want a friendship to work, mm -hmm. it takes both parties. It does. So assessing whether this is you and then really being able to be honest because if you want the relationship to work and you know, you have to show up with 50% of it. Yep. Then yeah. make sure you're actually showing up with 50%. Yeah. I think on the hills, I always used to say, to have a friend, you have to be a friend. I would always say mm -hmm. that. And it's so true because it can't just be one-sided all the time. It has to be both-sided. There has to be communication. And, you know, you have to be honest about how you feel and where you have to be vulnerable. You can't be afraid or step back and be afraid because they might get mad. Mm -hmm. There's ways of expressing your emotions and your feelings that won't make that person mad. You just have to be careful of your wording and and just speak from your heart, but not so it's not attackful or, you know, they don't get defensive, but it's not about them. It's more about you and how you're feeling. So how would you approach that? What sort of language would you use? I do this all the time. <laughs> I feel it depends on the person too, because some people in my life are so blunt and insensitive, but they're very like honest and I, I love that. So I don't take offense to it, but sometimes I'll be like, Ooh, that was, that was a little harsh. <laughs> like you could have said that a little differently cause I was hurtful. Mm -hmm. So also like if someone says something, you have to let them know too, like mm -hmm. that came off really hurtful and insensitive. And, you know, I think I know what you're, tr well, obviously I know what you're trying to say because you're so blunt about it, <laughs> but I'm sensitive. Like, can you be a little ease up on that? Yeah. There's a way to, to communicate with people. Some people are really sensitive. Some aren't. Some can take it. You just, to each his own. Yeah, that's so powerful because some, it does depend on intention. Intention matters. Yeah. You know, and so I've been married now for 20 years. Wow. And so if I don't know my husband by now, yeah. right? So it's like, I know his intention. But sometimes he's, he says things that are like sting me because he's yeah. way, I'm, I'm blunt girl. He's like next level blunt. Oh. <laughs> so I've done that work. And then my husband being blunt, what I'll do in those situations, I know his intention. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, hey, to your point, yeah. I'm a little upset. Like that did hurt. Yeah. I know you didn't mean to, but you've actually triggered me. Mm -hmm. Now, even with triggers, I, got, I recognize the triggers on me. It is my trigger. I have to work through it. Yeah. I don't want to live a life of triggers. Yeah. So I'll also say I'm working on this trigger, but for now, until I'm through it, please don't use this word. Don't use this yeah. phrase. And now back to your point about communication, yeah. you're letting that person in mm -hmm. versus keeping them at arm's length. Exactly. So there's no resentments or yeah. it builds up. I actually experienced this probably a few months ago, but there was a trigger. And I caught myself, like, because all the healing and recognizing those really helps, but you have to remind yourself. It takes work to remind yourself. Mm -hmm. But I'm, you know, it's fight or flight. I'm a flight person. I'm out of there. And so instead of communicating my feelings, I was like, I'm out. Bye. I'm leaving. And then I was like, wait, I need to talk through this and explain everything of why it upset me or what happened. And it was amazing. It was communicating and like working through that trigger. And now that trigger won't trigger me as much mm -hmm. because I've recognized it and I know how to work through it. And that all starts with the internal. It really does. If you want to learn the seven ways you can spot manipulation and gaslighting, then click here right now. When we are truly dealing with a manipulation strategy is that we tend to get gaslit into believing that what we're saying happened didn't happen. 